This is SciBite, episode 107, for October 29th, 2013. Hi, everyone, and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast live on a Tuesday evening and fresh on a Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our excellent host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So, what are we going to talk about this week? This week, we're going to take a look at a high school dinosaur discovery, technological seeing eye cane, satellites, both new and retiring, your feedback for bacteria eating viruses. And as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Dinosaur news, you say? Well, let's roll the dice. I'm hoping it's our first story. All right, what is our top news story this week, Heather? So, what were you doing in high school? <laughs> this young man had found a dinosaur skeleton that turns out to be the smallest youngest and most complete duck-billed dinosaur of its kind ever. Wow. Well, I think the best I was doing was fixing computers. I was definitely not finding dinosaurs. No, I wasn't finding dinosaurs. Uh, so there's a uh, museum in uh, California that's affiliated with this school district. It's a private you know, high school campus. And every year there's a group of these students that go out and they do some you know, paleontological field work as part of their school class. So mm. it's not just random. Their actually job is like go out in the field and they walk around and they look for stuff. So in 2009, one group of students, they were kind of looking around this area that had already been looked over because a lot of these areas have been looked over. They just kind of go out, look, see what they can find, say, hey, look at this. So one student spotted a little sliver of a bone peeking out from under a boulder, hmm. said, hey, wave arm, hey, curator, paleontologist guy over here. So they took a peek at it. They went, eh, it looks like probably a bit of a dinosaur rib. Interesting. Well noted on the map. Let's continue on because there's lots of things in this area. So they're not going to jump all over every tiny little bone. Okay. But then uh, later they kind of, you know, decided, let's take a peek at that one more time. Went around to the other side of the bold of this boulder and saw what looked like, you know, a big cobblestone. And they looked, turned it over and they looked and they said, that's a dinosaur skull. <laughs> they went back to the other side and it turns out that's toe bones on one side. A head on the other, there might be a dinosaur underneath this boulder. Whoa. So they returned uh, the next year, came, dug up this 360 kilogram, 800 pound rock, pretty much bound it all together, lifted it up by a helicopter, and, you know, sweeped it off to the museum for cleaning and picking and all that kind of stuff. Over 1,300 hours later, they actually kind of peeled away all the rock to show this uh, skeleton. And it was really amazing find of this uh, baby Parasophilus. Bofus, yes. Which is essentially a type of duckbill dinosaur. Oh. And it's one of those that had, you know, the, you know, in the adults that had those big crests over its head that they think were probably for some sort of calling. It gave him a specific sound. Now, the skull of this, what makes it so interesting is, well, one, they were able to go into the leg bone and they would take a, a little bit of the leg bone. And just like um, trees, the, you can see the growth rings and kind of age <laughs> it by that. Right. Which meant, and they didn't see any, which meant this little one was under a year old. Probably close to a year, but not quite a year old. And on the skull, they could actually see the start uh, bumps of this you know, of its um, crest. So that kind of gave them a bit of a puzzle because they'd never thought that the crest bumps would start growing that early in the development. Hmm. They've seen other species of this type that, you know, they can t map it out and say, okay, they start growing in a much later stage of development. But this little guy was very early. And the skull itself had actually been kind of split so it wasn't very, it wasn't completely whole, but erosion had sort of split it in half. But that was kind of good in the fact that they could actually see inside the skull 
so they could see these areas kind of um be able to see what was inside that it was maybe not as it would have been accessible if it had been in one giant piece hmm. of course then they go in and they do ct scans and try to get all the features out and try to get a better idea of what was going on that so is, that is kind of an amazing little story yeah now these kind of dinosaurs they he was born about the size of an infant and this little guy Within a year, they get to six feet long. <laughs> they grow really, really fast. If you thought it took a lot of food and little kids and dogs grow fast, <laughs> no, these dinosaurs grow really fast. Well, he's got a, you know, dinosaurs, it's a tough racket. You got to grow yeah. up quick, Heather. Yep. So if you're over there in uh, that area, if you go over to the ALF Museum, yes, uh, went on display on October 22nd, if you're not in the... San Francisco or California area, uh, you can go to dinosaurjoe.com because they named the little guy Joe. Dinosaur <laughs> Joe. Aw. Now, was that yeah. the high school kid's name or what? Uh, no. no, it wasn't no. his name. It was Screw that name. kid. They, they just nicknamed him. Now, he's now in college studying geology, but kind of something to put on your resume. Like, you're like, you know, you're going into college and you fill out your little form. No kidding. And sometimes they have a little story. It's like, I discovered a dinosaur skeleton. <laughs> yeah, what was your claim to fame? Oh, you know, this, you know, Joe the dinosaur? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was totally me. Yeah. <laughs> Let me in and you can say that you're a student this. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Heather, well, any other thoughts on that story? No, not yet. Oh, oh, you got a little robot there, but you're back. All right, Heather, well, then uh, let's uh, hit the uh, break button right here. Put the, put the pause on just for a brief moment. And I want to talk about ways you can support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and... The SciBy program. We have an affiliate system, which we have linked at the bottom of our website over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. If you go down there and you click before you shop, then your shopping session will be loaded with our affiliate tag, and then we get a percentage of whatever you decide to purchase. Now, we have a partnership with Amazon, uh, eBay, Netflix, Newegg, ThinkGeek, Best Buy, Audible, which is great. Code School, which is fantastic for self-taught programming. We also have Chrome and Firefox extensions. So if you load those, it'll automatically take your shopping session. But there's one that isn't linked down there. It's not in the extension because it's just doesn't, it's not compatible. It doesn't work. But it's one I've mentioned a couple of times on air. If you are looking for a VPN service, I want to recommend Pro XPN. First of all, I like them because they make it pretty straightforward. Second of all, they use, they use OpenVPN, which is the VPN technology I'm a fan of. And then third of all, they have a free smartphone app. At least I think it's free that will automatically route your smartphone traffic over the VPN. So if you go to coffee shops, use open Wi-Fi, or you want to access services in different countries, there's a lot of a lot of reasons to use VPN. And uh, go over to proxpn.com and use the promo code JBLive, and they will take 20% off the life of your account. And the rates are already pretty low. It's like 7 bucks a month or something like that uh, for uh, for pretty good VPN service. It uses multiple different technologies, but OpenVPN is the one I like, and they support it. So you can find that over at proxpn.com, and the discount code is JBLive. All right, Heather. Well, uh, how's your Skype connection? Is it okay? I think so. Okay, good. All right. You, you, uh, you, you caught all that and everything? Yes. Okay, good. Then I think it's settled out. All right. Well, then let's move on to the news bite. All right, Heather, what are we talking about in the news bite? All right, there's now a robotic seeing eye cane that can actually map out a path with 3D cameras, sort of pick out stairways, low overhangs, and other kind of stuff to help visually impaired. A seeing eye cane, so it's like a radar system that is in a cane, or is it like a oh, camera system? It is a camera system. Ah. It's built into sort of, um, now there are already robots that kind of use go around indoors, you know, collision detection and things like that. But this kind of a thing, margin is a little bit harsher. You know, if you have a little collision, you know, a little vacuum thing that goes around, okay, it bumps into the kitchen table every once in a while. Shrug shoulders. It yeah. happens. Yeah. You know, maybe for some reason it falls down the stairs, your tri-level house. Oh, sad. Let's see. If you're gonna it's in because you don't want that to happen to you if you are visually impaired. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, that's not really cool. So this is going to be able to either verbally warn or um, through a Bluetooth earpiece or possibly some sort of tactile feedback to sort of give them a little bit of steering maneuver 
So what this is, is there's, they call it navigation mode, which means there's a, uh, a roller tip in the bottom of the, of the cane. And it'll actually sort of drive the cane or point it to the direction that it thinks it needs to travel. So you can kind of go around and map out and then it will watch the camera and say, oh, you should go this way. Now, of course, obviously it's not, you know, dragging the person. It's just sort of rolling a ball suggesting, hey, I think you need to go this way. So it kind of gives them a, an idea of yeah. oh, you need to go more this way or that way. And of course, you know, it six degree of freedom type thing. So it's just making suggestions and you can turn it off or on while you're, while you're going. So it's just like, a, it's just a, an additional source of, of input of information. That's yes. It's totally, that's awesome actually. Yeah. It, you know, these type of things that are, you know, funded by various uh, groups, you know, National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bi- Bioengineering and Dashboard Robotics and the, you know, that kind of thing. Now, when it comes to this kind of um, robotic things that like you work with, that work alongside or, you know, with humans, they're not always crazy looking like the Boston Dynamics, you know, all the running, ro- the running robots and right. things like that. They're probably going to look more like this type of thing, which is essentially a, you know, seeing I came with some, it's like a box on it that is the camera. Yeah. And so, some, and a battery and some electronics and some Wi-Fi and a Wi-Fi chip too, it looks like. Yeah. And a USB so cable. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, well. You got to get you got to get debug info out of it. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty um, cool. But it's kind of interesting because all the different ways that it's working for to help um, convenience or people in various situations like yeah. the visually impaired yeah. to sort of make life a little bit easier to function on your own. Yeah. Without a necessarily. More independence. Dis- yeah, much more independence available. Oh, uh, Heather, I noticed the band has just stepped into the... Yeah, come on in, guys. Come on oh, in. Oh, they did? Oh, it's a two-one Hey! Yeah, come on, guys. <laughs> All right. Good job. Thanks, guys. Yeah. They All right. Good job uh, today. Now they're going to go back and uh, keep eating some ice cream. So what are we uh, talking about in the two-byte news? All right. We're going to talk about some satellites. A European satellite that was used for um, the GOCE, Gravitational Ocean Circular Explorer. Yeah. Essentially, it was launched in, 2000, launched in 2009. It was meant for like a two-year mission, but it consumed a lot less fuel than they thought it would. So it allowed them to sort of expand the lifetime of this. It was measuring really accurate gravity data on the Earth. Because it's not, we don't have completely level gravity. It's a little bit heavier or a little bit lighter in various areas. Now, this is not like, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm, this weight is 10 pounds here. It's we have eight lumpy pounds gravity. There. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> lumpy gravity? <laughs> lumpy gravity. Yes, that is one way to put it. There's okay, uh, okay. some images in the uh, the video in the show docs, or you can look at the uh, video, and it kind of shows you. At the, the lumpy earth that they show you looks kind of weird. But, it's you know, there's, you know, mountains and really thick parts of the mantle of the earth. And that's going to be a lot of density. So it's going to be a lot of mass. There's going to be a little bit heavier um, gravity there. Yeah. Of course, this is microscopic yeah. up and down. Yeah. But this kind of data lets some, um, if you have satellites going in orbit, then that kind of a little small fluctuations in the gravity can actually, you know, you need to take that in consideration when you're going around in orbit. Hmm. So that kind of things will, will help in that matter too. Now, it has reached the end of its extended life period and it's actually going to be coming down and bring up through the atmosphere uh, probably around November 6th. Aww. So not too far in the future. Aww. Yeah, no, most of the smaller pieces will burn up in the atmosphere. Though some will make it to the Earth's surface. Although the last time I checked, they didn't have precise uh, location for the calculations of where it would be mm. because they didn't have necessarily an exact um, estimate on when the time was going to come. Okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe we'll have a, uh, a an update at some point. Yes. Um, now, while that might be coming down, India's got something going up, don't they? That is right. This they've got their first true interplanetary probe coming. That's going to lift off in November, headed towards Mars. <clears throat> Ooh, really? Yep. Oh, yes. It's going to Mars. So it'll cr- be cruising for about ten months, and then it'll hit an elliptical orbit around Mars. 
the primary objective of the whole thing is to just demonstrate the technological capabilities. Um, and also, they've got some things in there to look for signs of life, study the planet's atmospheric composition. But, you know, I think it's one of those things where it's, let's put some science in here, but let's prove we could do it. Let's get all the hammering. Because it makes sense for the first time you send this kind of a probe out. Yeah. You're not going to dump a whole bunch of scientific equipment in there. Well, okay, so that might explain, because, you know, I noticed in the article you have linked in the show notes, it's just like the their budget is $73 million. Mm-hmm. Which doesn't sound like a lot, really. Yeah, so that would be part of it. You don't want to, if you're yeah, really yeah. on the edge of this, you don't want to dump millions and millions and right. millions of scientific equipment into something. Why not make a smaller mission, yep. shoot it off, right. and then if there are any little bugs or things you need to learn about, then you can kind of get all your uh, learning, you know, your learning growth spurts and all that kind of things on this first mission and be like, okay, now we know this, this, and this. So we can use that for the next mission where we put a whole bunch more money and scientific equipment into it. All right, Heather. Um, so I have an alert here. I'm either going to eject the warp core or this is an incoming communication. Oh, good. Okay. Good. It's, it's you, incoming you communication. sometimes when you go for that button because well, they're right next to each other. They should label them. Really? Because one, they just start flashing. I forget what they do. Oh. I know. I know. 107 episodes. You'd think I'd have it figured out by now. So what's our feedback this week? All right, we've got Steven, SMB in Flaw, probably Florida, in from the chat room. He sent me a article about bacteria eating viruses. Oh. So there's a specialist team of scientists from the Lun- University of Leicester um, who have isolated viruses that eat bacteria, which are called phages. And they specifically target these highly infectious hospital superbugs. Gross. Yeah, well, these are the kind of things that are really scary. Yeah. Because like, antibiotics... You know, antibiotic penicillin, when they were discovered, they've saved countless lives. Right. You know, impacted, you know, the well-being of humanity. But there's that kind of downward spiral that's going on. You know, I just can't help they'll get that leech feeling like, oh, put the leech in the blood to cleanse the blood. But I understand it's not that. These are going off and eating, you know, uh, uh, viruses. But it's just, it is weird. It's like, put this bad thing in me to make me better. But I guess it's, it's using our science knowledge on how to use these things for good. Yeah, I mean, there's their whole little purpose is to go out there and, you know, eat a specific species of, you know, bacteria. So it goes out and that's its whole purpose. So they can kind of tweak it to say, hey, go for this very specific type of bacteria. Go out, kill it. And they've got it for a couple of different strains of things. Okay. So what it does is, you know, it goes in, attaches to the bacteria, injects its little DNA, and then it explodes and makes a whole bunch of other things of the same type. So it goes through and sort of cleans out the system of that one bacteria. So Well, what's interesting, what strikes me, I I could be wrong, and sorry to interrupt, but just glancing through the article, they say uh, it's obviously, it's one alternative to antibiotics in a sense. Yes. And so you maybe avoid that resistance buildup to antibiotics if instead you're unleashing your army of bacteria on the virus. Yes. And I have been to the antibiotic uh, buildup thing where it's, you know, used to have a lot of ear infections growing up and even in college. I, you know, had this one, just couldn't kick it, couldn't kick it. And in college, the doctor's starting like, all right, hands me over the prescription. It's this and then the hospital. Let's hope this works. Wow. Because, you know, it just builds up an immunity. Yeah. You know, it, you know, then there's these super bugs, as they call them, that are really scary that just antibiotics can't kick it around the block. So maybe this so, could be a new weapon in fighting that kind of stuff. Yeah, this could be another a new weapon in fighting. Or with, um, look at the digestive tract. There are a whole bunch of good bacteria in your digestive tract that help you, you know, Natural, uh, you know, the digestive environment yeah. helps going after all that. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, antibiotics will kill off a lot of that too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that in there that as just, well, where and that can leave you with years of problems. I can tell you, I can attest to that. As can I. Mm-hmm. So this is the type of thing where if you tailor it to one specific bacteria, then it goes in. It's ignoring all the other bacteria. It's ignoring all the good stuff or anything else, and it'll just go down and hunt the one bad thing that you're trying to kill off. So it'll go through, and it's proven effective against about 90% of these uh, specific strains of bacteria that they're looking for. And it's 
up to the point where there's some pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. who are actually starting to develop these kind of therapies. Mm. So they're kind of um, target them about against specific things like um, one pathogen that's a lung function, a lung infection system fibrosis patients. So they're kind of moving it forward and they're starting to get ready for what they call phase one, phase two clinical trials, which means, you know, they'll start off with smaller groups of patients. But they're kind of hoping that this kind of efficiency, this kind of uh, therapy will help to kick off, um, you know, necessarily you don't have to use the broadband antibiotics for some of these things. Yeah, right. Yeah, it can be more targeted. Well, so uh, that was a that was a great one. So if you want to get a hold of the Sci-Bi Show, here's how you do it. You go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and then click on that contact link and choose SciBite from the drop down. And uh, Heather's also on Twitter as JB underscore Mars underscore base. So you can find her on there as well. All right, Heather, are you ready to jump in the time machine? I think so. All right, close the door and let's go. Here we go. Okay. One of these days, we're not going to close that door on time. I don't know. I, I had lava lamps. I had lights, but still, I have that sticky door. So this week, our destination takes us to 107 years ago, November 3rd, 1906. Heather, what happened this week in science? So SOS <laughs> it was specific specified as the international distress signal. You know, signed into, represented by 27 different nations. Over, you know, so this, everyone says, all right, we agree that it's that it's going to replace this old call sign. And by 1904, so most transatlantic British ships had this wireless equi equipment that said, all right, we're going to be able to say this is the, the code. You know, before it was um, Q -Q -Q CQD, uh, quick um, distress uh, what? That's no good. SOS is way better. And it's quick danger, just di uh, quick, come quick danger. Come, but, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I've heard of that. So SOS is not save our soul. It is not save our ship. Oh. It is simply because that is a very simple and straightforward signal. Yeah, it, it is, is. It is nine characters long and it is very easy you don't have to remember anything and in fact it could have been vtb because that is in different combinations s is three dots mm -hmm. and o is three dashes mm -hmm. but you know vtb also lines up to be the same thing it's just you know the dashes are belonging to different letters just they chose sos because it was much easier much cleaner to be like here it is. Instead of VTB, it's SOS. But that was clearly designed as the international distress signal, which we could use um, if we get stuck on the t in the uh, Cybite time machine, as long as we're not going farther back than 170 years ago. And as Star Trek shows us, it'll still be in use in 400 years. So there we go. There we know. We we already know that's fact. All right, Heather. Well, let me recalibrate. Recalibrate the side by 2000 and see if maybe we can look up into the sky this week. That's right. On Thursday, October the 31st, on Halloween, should Ooh. you be at a party and you might be at after night, you too can look super cool and knowledgeable. That's right. There will be no moon, but in the twilight, as we go over into the southwest, you're going to be able to see Venus and you're going to be able to point that out. Be like, you know what? But now after dark, twilight is area. That is Venus up there. From Halloween the smooth moves from Heather. There you go, kids. Yes. <laughs> you're moving on to Saturday about sunrise. Uh, you're going to be able to see, if you're on the eastern seaboard of North America, you look out and you get to see a partial eclipse of the sun. Now, this is not where it's a full eclipse. It's you're going to be able to see a, just a chunk taken out of the sun. Okay. Uh, it'll be daytime Sunday for Africa, the Middle East, Southern Europe. And, of course... Do not look at the sun directly. I repeat, do not look at the sun directly. You mm -hmm. might not be able to see the visuals in the show or the show notes if you do so. There are links in the show notes about how to safely view it. There you go. Even there if you, you think you could do best sometimes review all the rules and to see kind of where it might be. Uh, college, you like your eyes and they like you. Mm -hmm. All right. And in the Kind of on the whole, the planet side on Saturn, not really visible anymore. It's kind of 
hiding in the sunset now, so it's going to be not visible for a little while. Venus, as we talked about earlier, is in the southwest, uh, twilight to about an hour after dark. Mars this week is in Midnight Owl at 2 to 3 a.m. local time. Still near a blue-white star Regulus that we've been talking about. And should you still be awake at that time on for Halloween, that'll still be around there. If you're looking over to the, uh, you see it, and it's, you know, kind of reddish star is looks like Mars, and the blue-white one is kind of Regulus. And the blue-white one is actually four stars, two binary star systems. Again, you can look awesome and knowledgeable. Yeah. The comet Ison is still kind of hanging about right before dawn. It's a little before, a little below Mars, still only really visible through moderately sized telescopes. Um, links in the show notes about where it might be and a little bit more information about how you might be able to see that should you be able to. And Jupiter, of course, and also another awesome planet. Yeah, what's up, about, Jupiter? Yep, yeah, about 10, 11 p.m. local time. It's going to be rising in the east, northeast. There'll be two stars about eight degrees to the left of it, and 10 degrees is your fist held at arm's length, and that it, they are Castor and Pollux, which are the two main stars of the constellation Gemini. Oh, what a good, what a good, wow. That's a heck of a, that's a heck of an action-packed sky. Yes. With a little, uh, with some Halloween tips in there. So, like, here's what you could do. You could be at your Halloween party with your internet phone or your Google-powered phone, and then you just bring up the Jupiter Broadcasting website, you go click on SciBite 107, and then scroll down to the bottom of the show notes, and you can get all of that outlined. Of course, everything Heather t- talks about is linked, and also a lot of times there's additional videos, visuals, and all kinds of things. Heather, anything else we want to cover before we run? Yes. This Sunday, we get an hour back of oh, yeah. lives. It right. is daylight savings time for yeah. all states and countries who actually observe it. So about it is officially at 2 a.m., you can put back your clock to 1 a.m. and we get back that hour of time that spring stole from us because <laughs> we fall behind. Okay. Now, you know what? Did you know? Have I told you? Now, we're still troubleshooting it for every for all locations around the world, supposedly. Uh, but if you go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, it now automatically updates to represent our show times in your local time zone. Wow. Yeah. So when when uh, the fall behind, which like Heather mentioned, happens on Sunday, November 3rd, which will probably mess with Lass. Wait, does that mean I get to sleep in a little bit more before Lass? Yes. <gasps> oh, that's going to be a good show. That's going to be a good show. That's gonna, I got to make sure my guest knows because I, I think he's in a different, I think he's in Germany. I'm not sure where he's at. Yeah, but not all countries and states and time zones actually observe, but. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very good, Heather. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much. Now, don't forget, we'd love to hear from you. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link. And totally join us, would you? Go over to jblive.tv Tuesdays, 7.30 p.m. That's Pacific. And that would be 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget about t- uh, daylight savings, though. All right, Heather. Well, thanks for the great show. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>